All right, guys, I have a very fun video for you today. Inside my little treasure chest here is my bow collection. Uh, just quick note, I did not pay that for these bows. I've gotten lucky a few times and I also bought a couple of these years back. So 30K for a bow might sound insane and it is quite a bit of money. And you probably already know that, you know, Stradivarius cellos and violins go for millions of dollars. But keep in mind, bows can already go for hundreds of thousands of dollars. I've often talked about getting a new bow with your existing cello and how much of a difference it makes. This is why we're gonna go ahead, I'll play for you, and I want you to hear the difference. Same instrument, same player, different bow. Okay, let's get started. We have a Paul Seafried bow. Um, he passed away recently, so he's a contemporary maker. Uh, and this one is valued at about 6K. All right, so this Seafried is actually very interesting from the player's point of view. It's weighted at 87 grams, which is quite heavy. So the average for a cello bow is 80. 82 is on high average. You know, 78 is starting to get a little light. 87 is a beast. and. It's interesting, it's one of those bows where if you try to move it around like a, a light bow, it's a lot of work. But if you actually kind of relax and, and let the bow do more of the work, it will um, because it's so heavy. Fortunately, it's balanced really well. So even though it's so heavy, it doesn't feel clunky. It just feels heavy, like beautifully heavy. So it's kind of maybe like a Cadillac sedan where you're not going to have the the turning radius and the you know sports suspension but it's still a very luxurious fun ride um, and it is a lot of fun to play on uh, you'd think that something like this would be really hard for fast playing but actually again the same thing less gets you more so you can actually kind of sit back and relax and just kind of get your arm going and it'll do a lot of the work for you. So what would this not be great for? Probably, um, you know, Baroque music for sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, early classical music, Mozart, you know, stuff where you're holding the bow up and just doing a, a whole bunch of light spiccato throughout symphonies. Uh, that, that would probably be a little overly taxing. And also the sound is a little too present um, for, for that kind of repertoire. $75 uh, Chinese unbranded bow and uh, just a side note this was for a student so playing wise it, it you work very very hard it's what I the biggest complaint it's a wood stick so actually I don't 
really hate the tone it makes. It just doesn't make much tone and it's like incredibly flexible, the stick itself. So, I mean, I have this hair very tight and it's just, you know, if you sink down, it just kind of like, bleh. if you're playing a gig in the desert with like a high wind warning and you're worried about getting your good stuff sandblasted, this is the way to go. We have uh, Claude Thomasin um, from the early 1900s, and this is another French bow. Uh, it's priced a little over 30K, I believe, right now. And um, it's weight-wise, it's 80 grams on the dot, so kind of exactly what you would maybe take a guess a cello bow should be weighed at. So the interesting thing about this bow was that when I was bow shopping, uh, it was being sold at a much, much, much lower price because it's gold mounted but they thought it was originally silver mounted and so for someone to come in and redo it to gold it doesn't actually make it more valuable because it's no longer original so i love the bow so i bought it thinking wow what a steal i got a thomas Ann at an amazing price and then i had it evaluated and it turned out that the gold was original um, so that was very very fortunate it kind of brings up and a really interesting aspect especially when you start bow shopping in like a higher price range, the things that, that like drastically reduce the value, um, sometimes you'd be shocked that like just, you know, a, a replacement button can devalue something so much or, you know, some a later frog would be probably an, an obvious thing. Like someone, the original frog was damaged and they there's a later one non-original. Um, clearly all original is what makes it most valuable, but one thing I should say is that that's not always a bad thing if it's marked down because, you know, if a bow has been, let's say it had a little crack in a place and it's been like very securely repaired, the price is really going to reflect that little injury the bow had. But that also means you might be able to grab a bow that would normally be way out of your price range and it probably will play the way it, it should have played you know, since it's been repaired well. I should say also just if you're in the market shopping for bows, one thing to think about is that a heavy bow or a light bow doesn't necessarily feel heavy or light. So for example, you might try out a bow that's 76 grams, it's feather light for a cello bow, but if it's weighted poorly with too much weight in the tip, it's gonna feel actually pretty heavy and clunky because the weight hasn't been distributed evenly throughout the stick in the right way. And so it's, it just feels like a lot of work every time you're trying to change strings or, or you know, do a, a sauté or some kind of bow stroke where the tip weight really matters. Conversely, I've actually played on bows that are well over 90 grams that were also, I think it was a James Tubbs bow. It was super heavy, but again, beautifully balanced and it felt really light. It was easy to move. It pulled a beautiful sound. I sort of fell in love with it for a minute, but um, you know, it was super heavy, but it felt light as a player. Yeah, each bow you have kind of has like different quirks and different, you know, like, oh, well, in the middle, this one feels this way, or I feel like I need to use a little more weight or a little less speed, you know, these kind of things. But that's actually kind of a really great thing because uh, as much about the bow as like the player itself, I think if you gave these bows to a different player, you, it, you know, it might sound different, totally different, even on the same instrument. So what's great about that is that if you go shopping, there's variety. So your the way you draw sound, the way you kind of use the bow in your plane, there's going to be one that's kind of more tailor fit to match your style. Um, so anyway, I hope that kind of gave some insight into basically letting me put, you know, Put, like demonstrate what I keep saying about how important bows are in this whole equipment game. Um, and if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And if you haven't done so, please go ahead and subscribe. Thanks so much. See you next week.